In physics, we spend a lot of time theorizing about the details of the fundamental structure of the world around us. But that moment where an experiment finally shows data that confirms brand new knowledge about our universe, that is a special and rare moment. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from someone who was there, or almost there as you'll hear, during one of these special moments. This day would become known as the November Revolution and would change how we understand the fundamental particles of our world. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. When I was a student, you know, studying particle physics for the first time, the textbooks that I would read presented a pretty complete picture of how physicists at the time saw their universe. They described this remarkable theory that we called the standard model of particle physics. And although no one at the time, or, or now for that matter, really thinks that the standard model will turn out to be the whole story of how our universe worked, everyone agreed at the time, and everyone agrees now, that it is an incredibly powerful and successful theory, and it describes everything we observe at particle accelerators and other such experiments remarkably well. Particle physicists have not always had such a quote-unquote standard model in their hands, though. And today on Why This Universe, we're going to talk about a particular moment, a formative moment, that we encountered on the road to building and accepting the seminal theory of nature. This is a moment that occurred back in November of 1974, just about 50 years ago, when two independent groups of physicists discovered a new kind of subatomic particle. Now, throughout history, physicists have discovered a lot of new particles, and um, not all of them have been huge revolutions in our understanding of physics, but this one was, and that's why we call it this moment the November Revolution. We're very happy to have on Why This Universe today Chris Quigg who's going to walk us through this uh, moment of the November Revolution. Chris is a theoretical physicist, and he's a distinguished scientist emeritus at Fermilab, where I work. Um, He's an expert in all sorts of different things in particle physics, including stuff like electric symmetry breaking, uh, the dynamics of the strong nuclear force, and the physics of particle colliders. He's also an author, and he just put out a book a few months ago, um, co-authored with Robert Kahn, entitled Grace in All Simplicity, Beauty, Truth, and the Wonders on the Path to the Higgs Boson and New Laws of Nature. Welcome, Chris, to Why This Universe. Good to be with you. All right, so Chris, let's start by painting a picture of what was going on in particle physics before the November Revolution of 1974. Um, I'll I'll leave it to you where to start. There are lots of interesting things going on, but you you can uh, paint the picture as you see it. We thought uh, things were happening around us. We didn't quite understand the pace at which they were happening, and we didn't know which things would turn out to be highly meaningful and others might just be momentary blips. So the reason I had come to Fermilab in the summer of 1974 was that outside my window was going to be the highest energy particle accelerator in the world, not yet a collider, but uh, just an accelerator that would provide proton beams of 200, 300, eventually 400 billion electron volts. And that was going to be a new world, and so that was going to be exciting. In the background, there were developments that had been happening. One was the conjecture from the 1960s, the mid-1960s, by George Zweig and Murray Gell-Mann, that particles such as the proton and the pion might be made of more fundamental tiny things, idealized as point-like, that is to say, having no size whatsoever. These were eventually named the quarks. This was a a hypothesis. It was a a hypothesis that was regarded as too simple to be true by many people. (laughs) And so lots of people would do calculations in which they would uh, secretly, in the, the privacy of their room or office, would use quarks. And then afterwards, they would say, well, I don't believe in quarks. It's a convenient mathematical fiction, but I believe the answer. Fictitious, but useful. Exactly. Uh, So not fully kosher, shall we say. In 1968, an experiment at the Stanford Lydia Accelerator Center 
scattering what were then very high energy electrons from targets that contain protons seemed to indicate that there were within the proton little hard electrically charged things, which would naturally be the quarks, although many people hesitated to say that out loud. There was a uh, framework built up around that, championed by Richard Feynman and uh, James Burkane, which suggested that there really, really, really were tiny charged hard things inside the proton. Now, when did people like Feynman and, and Burkane start to make that case? Were they believers in the quark model from the beginning, from Gelman's days, or did, did they kind of come along in later years? Very interesting to ask. So uh, Gelman, although late in life, claimed that he had believed in quarks all along, was giving talks, some of which I heard as a student, that suggested that he was uh, timid, shall we say about jumping to conclusions. This is not necessarily a character flaw. It, the, the idea of among physicists that even when we have an idea that we think is really good, we hesitate to assume that nature takes the idea as seriously as we do. So it's a kind of uh, humility. <laughs> <laughs> not, not often attached to physicists by the, uh, <laughs> the people who observe them. So he was slow to be convinced. George Zweig, on the other hand, was all in from the beginning. He thought uh, this was highly simple, but uh, it was too good not to be true. Mm. So from the uh, original reports in 1968 of the MIT Slack experiments, Burkane and Feynman were on the case that this could indicate a new level, simpler level of internal structure of the protons. Interestingly, the the proton we now know has a certain size, and so it looks like it's composite. That hadn't really been pinned down as an experimental observation until the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s. So, of course, I was born into that world. But for other people, they had been alive when that great, great penetrating right. insight came. But what exactly was inside, whether it was some mushy stuff or has turned out to be the case, these uh, tiny ind individual constituents was a wide open question. And there was a, a great deal of belief that the strong interactions were so complicated that you were never going to get to the bottom of anything and that looking for a simple explanation, a simple calculus, was a fool's errand. Yeah, compared to other branches of science, particle physics, you know, once we figure out the answer, you know, we found things tend to be very simple. I mean, people think particle physics is complicated, but it's it, it's only complicated in the sense that it takes a lot of mathematics to describe. But in the end, we have very, very simple, elegant descriptions of these phenomena that you can't offer in other branches of science. You know, the, if you want to ask how a cell works, you can't write it down in a, you know, a few sentences or something. But if you want to ask how quarks and, you know, other particles work, you can write down the math that describes them in, in one line or a few lines of, of, of mathematics. It is true. We have a small number of principles. To be sure, we don't know exactly where those princi sure. principles come from. We haven't derived them from anything. But we have a small number of principles. We have a small number of actors, the fundamental constituents of quarks and leptons, as we call them. And once we have those rules in place, then it's a matter of being clever enough to derive the consequences mm -hmm. of those rules and, and to compare them with experiment. So those things were going on. There was another development, which was the uh, development of a theory of the weak and electromagnetic interactions. This was put together in the f almost the final form that we recognize by Steven Weinberg in 1967. So let me try to unpack that for our, our listeners for a second. So in, in the way that people had seen the weak force act on things prior to this, it would always do something like change an electron into a neutrino. So you are changing the charge of the electric charge of the kinds of particles involved. But Weinberg and these other guys said, well, no, we've got this theory and there should be in addition to those charge changing interactions, there should be ones that don't change the charge of particles called neutral That's currents. Right. right. That's good. right. Good, good. And in 1973, in a very large bubble chamber experiment at CERN, um, people found at first one example of a reaction that, according to the old theory, could not happen. 
Literally one event? One event was the uh, the first. Wow. And I, I happened to be at CERN in the summer of 1973. And although I wasn't privy to the internal discussions of the collaboration, you know, I could see how nervous they were <laughs> during the day and night, uh, trying to convince themselves selves, um, that this was not a background event, but something that was real. So let, let me describe this event first, because if it were real, it's unambiguous. It's a, an event in which a neutrino associated with the muon, a heavy kind of electron, scatters from an electron, and they both go out without changing their identity. So it's a very beautiful and characteristic picture in this big bubble chamber. If it was real, this was a new phenomenon. Could it be faked by something? Well, they went into great detail trying to examine sources of background and all of that. They also had a few events in which the muon's neutrino interacted with a heavy nucleus in the bubble chamber liquid and went off as a neutrino, not as a muon. These are easier to fake and so if you were going to give a single event uh, example of something that proved it, it wasn't what you wanted to show. But having those in hand encouraged them to think that this first neutrino electron event was real because they saw other things that should be happening. But it quickly became clear that this new phenomenon, a new force of nature had been discovered. And that was um, encouragement to take seriously the idea of the theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions, the electroweak theory. Good. So we've got a situation now. We haven't got into the revolution of 1974 yet, but in the years building up to it, two separate big things are happening. People are starting to take seriously the picture where protons, neutrons, pions, all this stuff are made up of quarks, individual quarks. And simultaneously, people are starting to accept this new theory of Weinberg and others for the inner or the weak and uh and, and electromagnetic force, the electroweak theory. And and they're starting to see evidence of this in experiments. There are two other ingredients that we need to uh, need to cite before we get to the great day of November eleventh, nineteen seventy four. Okay. Good, good. One is if you believe that neutral currents had been discovered, then there's a long history of looking for neutral currents, but the searches were always done looking for neutral currents that would change the strangeness, one of the possible quantum numbers of a quark. So change a strange quark into a non-strange quark or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Or vice versa, that's right. One of the contributions of Glasho, Iliopoulos, and Wayani was to introduce a fourth quark never before seen, what we call the charm quark. And by doing this in the nice way they did, you canceled off strangest changing neutral currents, all flavor changing neutral currents, but could be left with the kind that were seen in the CERN experiment and, and eventually in others. Yeah. So before this, you had three kinds of quarks, up, down, and strange. And the strange ones should be able to be changed into, say, down ones. But you didn't see that. And these theorists came along and said, we can explain that if there's this fourth quark, the charm quark, right? Right. And that meant there would be four quarks. There were at the time four leptons, the electron, the muon, and the neutrino going with each of those. So there was a nice symmetry. We've even learned over time that that symmetry is serious and means, means something. Now, a few people, uh, one of them was Mary Kay Gayar, who was at the time uh, spending time at Fermilab. She was jumping up and down and saying, if neutral currents are real, then by the argument of Glasho, Iliopoulos, and Mayani, there must be a fourth quark. And if there's a fourth quark, we must be able to find a way to find it. Then, originally off to the side, in 1973, there was a breakthrough in the theory of strong interactions. Mm -hmm. So strong interactions, as I said, have been quite murky. There's a long line of people proving that the parton model, Feynman's way of thinking about these little hard guys inside the proton, didn't make any sense in field theory. You couldn't make up a theory that did this. Gelman used to call it the put-on model because no respect, self-respecting theory would yield these results. And people of my generation had uh, great sport and calculating in this field theory and that field theory and saying, ha ha, it doesn't work. Uh, leaving the most complicated calculations, of course, for last. And those were done in 1973 by David Follitzer at Harvard, uh, David Gross and Frank Wilczek at Princeton. And they found, to uh, the surprise of many, 
that in the special kind of theories that uh, we now embrace for nearly everything, you can have the picture described by the parton model of these guys looking like they're almost free particles inside the proton. And yet when you try to pull them out, they can't come out, that they're permanently confined. When people say partons in, in that period of time, do they mean something different from quarks? Are they, or are they just quarks and partons, different words for the same thing? This was Feynman's name for the little hard charged things inside protons before it was obvious that they were quarks. Okay. This had always been a conundrum for the quark model that if, you're, if the quarks are real, why haven't we seen them? Mm-hmm. And people had done all sorts of searches for them in accelerators. There were a bunch of <laughs> physicists who, were, who knew how to live, who convinced some funding agency that uh, oysters would concentrate quarks out of seawater. And so they bought a great <laughs> supply of oysters. And they had to devise an experimental protocol to get rid of the oysters. I think they were bright enough to eat them all. And then they ground up the oyster shells uh, looking for the concentrated quarks and didn't find any, but they ate a lot of oysters. So this theory of the strong interactions was there. <laughs> it has the is that a true property. story? Sorry, what? <laughs> it is an oft-repeated story. And okay. I, I believe Urban it's a legend. true story. <laughs> I know some people who claim to be involved. In it. What, what could oysters have possibly had to have done with quarks? <laughs> oh, there were elaborate calculations of quark chemistry that people did, some of which were kind of serious, uh, and one of one of which at least led to this uh, idea that we now regard as cockamamie, but if they had found them, we would have said, great God. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, it was not obviously cockamamie at the time. Okay, amazing. Well, probably it was, but, you know, you've got to, uh, when you're desperate, you've got to look in all possible ways. So all these ideas were there. We didn't know how seriously to take them and uh, whether they had anything to do with each other. So that brings us to November 11th, 1974. When there was a meeting of the the SLAC Center Center for Linear Accelerator Center Program Advisory Committee, Sam Ting, who was leading a Brookhaven experiment to collide protons with targets. On Monday morning, he went into the director's office and told the director, Pete Panofsky, and about this marvelous resonance that they discovered at Brookhaven. Explain what you mean by that. Explain what, the, what it means to have seen a resonance. We know in everyday life a little bit about what a resonance is. If somebody plays a flute, they're blowing air across an opening with a tube or an organ pipe, and that makes a particular pitch. In particle physics, we look at unstable particles. So particles that live momentarily and then are characterized by disintegrating into a few other particles as resonances if they have this property of having a well-defined, maybe not perfectly, but well-defined mass and a well-defined lifetime. Good. So when they, they measure the energy of these electrons and positrons that come out of the, this kind of event... They all have a certain amount of energy, and it's a sharply peaked thing at one particular value that you wouldn't have had. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. So, so is the term resonance here like an analogy, or is it? Are you literally talking about, say, the wavelength of these particles? So it's good. It's it's very much the same kind of phenomenon. The uncertainty in the mass corresponds to the purity and in tone of a sound resonance that we would hear. Okay, so they had found this. They had not published it. Who knows why? You know, they say they were checking under different conditions and so on. So Sam comes to uh, Slack. He announces this to Panofsky and Richter. Over that weekend, over that very weekend, using sort of the backwards technique, colliding electron and positron, concentrating a bunch of energy and then seeing what came out, the Slack Berkeley group had found this stupendous resonance, stupendously narrow, very high. And so it's the same thing. It's at the same mass. Utterly astonishing. That uh, threw the program advisory committee meeting into shambles. I had been told in advance that there wasn't going to be much business anyway. The business became presenting the evidence for these uh, remarkable co-discoveries that were made at the time. And the people in the room really didn't expect anything of consequence to happen at this meeting. This was all unexpected, like taking these people totally off guard. I believe that's the case. So I'll tell you why I wasn't there. 
Panofsky had just asked me, you know, I was a kid. And so Panofsky had just asked me to join the program committee. Every program committee has to have one inexperienced person on it, I suppose. <laughs> but had said, you know, this meeting is going to be purely ceremonial. We don't really have anything to decide. We're going to say goodbye to the old people who are leaving the committee. Welcome to the new people. If I were you, I'd stay at home. So I stayed at home and I wrote some terribly meaningful paper for the physical review. <laughs> was Remarkably bad advice. Wow. <laughs> Remarkably bad advice. Since then, I've never trusted a lab director <laughs> ever. And I've never missed another committee meeting, although I haven't been rewarded for that little bit of virtue. Um, yeah, so it was quite a remarkable event. We got the word. I was uh, sitting in my office feeling virtuous that I had skipped this meaningless meeting. And my colleague Ben Lee came in and he was completely flustered, which I'd never seen him before, and told me he'd just gotten a call from Slack describing what had been found. And to him, having done this work on weak and electromagnetic interactions on the search for charm, it was pretty obvious, or at least he strongly hoped, that this would be a sign of a charm quark and at any charm quark making a resonance. Such a thing had been described in the paper by Guy Arley and Rosner, but not nearly in the dramatic form in, in which it was seen. They imagined there would be something around this mass, but that it would be, and there would be kind of a narrow resonance, kind of definite mass, but not nearly. No, I mean, what was found was just the grand imaginary extension yeah. of what people had Cleaner thought. and more pristine than they had hoped for. Right. Yeah. Good. So uh, people started ga gathering in my office and then outside, you know, the, at Fermilab, there are these uh, floor to ceiling blackboards. So we're covering the blackboards with, with things. And because two different experiments had seen what looked like the same thing using very different techniques, it was hard to imagine that this was just some displaced yeah. cable or programming error or something like that. So to kind of put this all in the big picture, we have a state in the years leading up to the November Revolution where... Sure, there was some evidence for the quark theory, or at least some sort of parton theory describing the structure of protons and things, but lots of skepticism. There was the beginning of the electroweak theory put forth by Weinberg and others, but in its naive form, it had some problems. And then, uh, you know, it was shown that if there's this fourth quark, you could solve some of those problems. Thirdly, there had previously been thought to be all these problems with the strong force. Um, but those in 73 or something by Will Check and his collaborators started to show that those might be okay. And then all those things kind of get resolved sort of at once with this discovery of charm quarks and this resonance in 1974, paving the way for a picture where all these things get incorporated into the same common theory and the same common language what we now call the standard model. Is that is that a, a good... Am I missing something important there? Is that... Well, that's right? the beginning of it. Of course, there were complications. There are always complications in a good story. Yeah. So there were two complications in, in this story. One of the reasons that it took so long, so painfully long to those of us who wanted the answer, to find charm particles is that, again, the probability of interactions didn't quite add up to what it should have. And the reason for that was an astonishing coincidence, which that was that in addition to the charmed quark in this mass range, there was another charged lepton, a cousin of the electron and muon called the tau lepton. So that was complicating the picture because those are being made in the same energy regime, not as a narrow spike, but, you know, filling in what was going on and giving final states that were interesting unforeseen backgrounds to the search for charm. So that's a great discovery on its own. It points to the beginning of a, yet another pair of uh, quarks and leptons. There were other experiments in atomic physics studying consequences of the electroweak theory. And at first they got results that were in conflict with the particular version put forward by Weinberg, Salam, Lasha, Willi, Oplis, and Mayani and led to what you could think of as wild goose chases for theorists, but in fact, for the people who like to build models, 
it was the best time of their lives because they could build models to try to find out how to reproduce uh, the result of the day. Those experiments finally went away and eventually gave results that were consistent with the Weinberg et al. model. One of those was an experiment done in electron scattering at SLAC using polarized beams and targets later on. So it took a while for things to come together, but we had this feeling that lots of things were going on. I've said, if, if you talk to different people who were alive at the time, they, almost all of them believed that they were in the center of the action. And I think, you know, this is not, not simply people being full of themselves. There was so much going on that everybody could believe that they were in the center of the action. And so many questions to answer, things to work out. And it was a great time all around. 1977, an experiment led by Letterman at uh, Fermilab found evidence for a new family of particles that we now know are made of the next quark, the B quark, and its uh, antiparticle. By that, that point, there was no meaningful resistance to the idea that quarks were mechanical objects because we could see a spectrum of resonances that they, uh, they formed. But it, it took a while. It was uh, you know, frustrating at times, but also highly wonderful because so many things were going on. So, Chris, I have kind of one question for you that I, I think I, I, this 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 whole conversation uh, at least makes me wonder. You know, in this long career in physics, you've had you've seen many examples of important moments that will be written about in the history of physics for you know centuries to come. But how easy it, or, or difficult has it been in your experience? to know which of those are actually important at the time? Like, is it clear in, in, you know, in the room when you're learning about it that this is going to be something 50 years ago we're going to be talking about? Or, or you know, is, 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 can you tell the real consequential moments apart from the flashes in the pen? Dan's asking for, uh, for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> asking for a friend, yes. <laughs> well, uh, Sam Treeman, who is an excellent theorist at uh, Princeton, had many brilliant students, used to say, things that seem too good to be true usually are too good to be true. So one develops a sense of uh, things that just don't add up, mm -hmm. you know, that seem too far off scale. The trouble is that if you're very conservative in choosing which problems to follow, you will miss the opportunity to stretch your mind by considering outlandish things. And once in a blue moon, you may miss an actual discovery. So I think all of us have to decide how we apply our time, you know, what's, uh, what looks important to us, what looks like it might be of lasting interest, what matches our ability to analyze things and to uh, say, well, if this is true, then that should be true, which is in my particular brand of of theoretical physics closely engaged with experiment, what I what I do a lot of the time. Uh, there are some things where you just know the world has changed. So uh, November 11th, 1974. I remember a little bit after that, I was uh, on a little West Coast tour. I went to Berkeley, which had been the home of the old style thinking about uh, the strong interactions, something called the bootstrap hypothesis, where mm -hmm. all particles to pions, protons, and so on, were made of all, of all the other particles, and there was no elementary particle. And I told Jeff Chu that I'd been, who was the, the master of this, this mode of thought, very brilliant and charismatic man. I said, you know, I've been working on these problems having to do with particle production at high energies, motivated by what was happening at Fermilab. I got to talk with great minds like Feynman and and uh, Ken Wilson, we were all working on the same thing. So for a kid, that was that was great. But that, and I, I thought we'd gotten much further than I expected at the beginning. But that when I saw these peaks on November 11th, <laughs> I was totally recalibrated. Well, Jeff was uh, not only charismatic; he was also uh, had strong belief in his way of thinking. And he said, "No, don't you see? First, there were three quarks. Now four. Soon, an infinity." And that's the bootstrap. So for him, it was not the recalibration it was for me. And he was an outstanding scientist. But for me, that was, you know, on that day, you just knew the world had changed. 
what was interesting was that there were all these concepts that had been in our heads before, which we treated tentatively. And now we knew we had to take them more seriously and see if the picture really added up. A big thank you to Chris Quigg for sharing his story with us today. His book, Grace in All Simplicity, Beauty, Truth, and Wonders on the Path to the Higgs Boson and New Laws of Nature is out now, so check it out. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegsman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show, as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash why this universe. Thank you so much for listening and for your support.